You don't hear the phrase flesh pots very much these days because it refers back to the old King James translation. Uh, but if ever, anyone ever mentions flesh pots today, they're usually referring to uh, people or places of sexual temptation. In the Bible, though, flesh pots are uh, literally, they are cauldrons of meat, pots of flesh to eat. Um, they are a temptation, but there is nothing sexual about them. The context is Exodus chapter 16. The people of God have been brought out of slavery, brought through the Red Sea, but now they are faced with a new and deadly challenge. They no longer have to worry about their slave masters. Now they just need to find a way of feeding two million people in the desert every day. Exodus 16 from verse 2. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat round pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you've brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Here is a sobering fact. The Lord does not deliver them directly from slavery into the land of milk and honey. In between, there is a wilderness. There is a place of hardship and testing. It's a picture of our own Christian lives. We are saved from sin and Satan, and we are brought out into newness of life, but we are not yet living with Christ in the new creation. Right now is a time of daily dependence on the Lord. And just like the Israelites, we too are tempted to grumble about our present and to idealize our past. To say things like, oh, the old life was wonderful. Wasn't, wasn't Egypt brilliant? We conveniently misremember. Wasn't Egypt fantastic? It was just all feasting and fullness. That's how the Israelites were recalling their time of slavery and genocide. Oh, forget the slavery. Forget the slave masters. Forget the genocide. Do you remember the barbecues? Weren't the barbecues good? You know, that's, that's what the flesh pots were. There were these cauldrons of meat which the Israelites harked back to. Flesh pots are not about our sex life. They are about our old life. But here's the issue. Lusting after some nostalgic conception of the past can be even more spiritually poisonous. In the wilderness years, the Israelites would often hark back with rose-tinted glasses to their time in Egypt. So, for example, in Numbers chapter 11, verse 5, they say, We remember the fish that we ate in Egypt at no cost. Also, the cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions, and garlic. Very literally, they looked back on their green salad days. But now, now they just look out at the desert and all they see is scarcity and death. When Jesus leads us into a desert place, this is our temptation too. We start to reimagine life without him as flesh pots. We, we start to reimagine our past. We start to look out at the non-Christian world and we just see flesh pots everywhere. And so we just grumble and we say, our past was carefree and wonderful. But now Jesus has led me away from life and fullness. He's just led me into this desert to starve me. Such grumbling really grieves our Lord. He has fought to the death to buy our freedom. When we fondly remember life in Egypt, it's like some spiritual Stockholm Syndrome. Do you know Stockholm Syndrome? It's where those who are kidnapped end up developing feelings for their captors. It's crazy, but you end up loving your slave masters. This is what happens with us too. We were enslaved to the old life, but we also loved it too. And sometimes it just makes us hark back and then grumble about the present. Now, just as an aside, um, the Bible is full of legitimate complaints. You can complain to the Lord. Plenty of times in the Bible, people are struggling and they tell God that they are unhappy. That's not a problem. That's a prayer. The Psalms are full of complaining prayers. The psalmist keeps on saying, Lord, this is terrible. I can't handle it. What are you going to do? That's a perfectly good prayer. But there is an, there, there's another way of handling disappointment, and that way is to moan to one another in unbelief. And when we wallow in a complaining spirit while never actually addressing our complaint to God, that's grumbling. And the Lord takes offense. Of course he takes offense. We're basically calling the Lord a murderer. We're effectively saying, you saved me from slavery in order to starve me in the desert. You're a sadist, Lord. That's what we're saying when we grumble. We're imagining that God is the one who is anti-life. The truth is Egypt was anti-life. The old life, that was anti-life. The old ways were trying to kill us. 
God is not trying to kill us. He's trying to save us. But this is the way through the wilderness and into glory. It's the only way. And he longs for us to trust him. Tomorrow we're going to see how God answers these complaints in Exodus chapter 16. Tomorrow we'll see the incredible grace that he pours out on grumblers. But for now, let's ask ourselves, are we, mis- are we misremembering our non-Christian past? And are we looking out to the world right now and seeing flesh pots and just imagining that the Lord is keeping us from all the good stuff? Those flesh pots are lies. They are mirages. They do not satisfy and they certainly do not save. But Jesus does. Let's look again to him and say in the words of Psalm 73, Who have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire beside you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart. And he is my portion forever.